We're ready to go. Yes, recording has started. I just want to remind you that all resources um, from all these sessions are available at this link. Um, we've been housing all of the different sessions and extra materials there. In addition, uh, so all the links that I'll be um, providing will be uh, providing the, the PowerPoint. Oh, some of you like to have the PowerPoint ahead of time, so I will grab the link for that for you right now. Because you take some notes. Um, and I'll just pop that in the chat. Uh, but I will also be uploading a PDF um, to this website for under assessments. Um, so last week we did a runoff vote and uh, I promised I would tell you sooner, but I'm sorry, I'm really just operating on just in time right now. I probably could have spent another three hours designing uh, the stuff for you today. This is really exciting stuff. I really love talking about it. So I'm going to reiterate, please reach out um, to CPI so that we can talk about your assessment specifically. Um, I know that this is a really just a broad overview um, and uh, it really depends on your discipline and what your um, learning outcomes are. But I I, there are some fun things that I do want to talk to you about. So I'm excited that you chose mind mapping and note taking in particular because that's a, a thing that uh, I love. Um, and then research and essay writing, um, I'm going to actually do last because I think the first two kind of fold nicely into it. Um, so that's our agenda for today. We're going to talk about mind maps, note taking, and then the, the research pa paper and essay. Um, so just to remind you, last week we talked about, you know, why we do assessment. And so there's three different um, lenses we can think about. It could be for learning. So as we go along, we're just uh, making sure that the, the learning is on track. Um, it could be summative and that's our typical final exam. Um, and that's of learning, but also there's opportunities for us to use assessment as learning. We know that the opportunity to ask a question and for you to stop and think about it meaningfully is a way of you um, actually learning the material. So uh, th there's these three things that we, I want you to bear in mind as we go through these different types of assessments. So mind maps um, are like I'm a huge fan of them if you've ever seen my drawings. Um, so basically they're, and a lot of people are like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Sometimes they're also called concept maps. They're basically a visual representation of a subject um, that lets you represent uh, their connections to each other. So you can have a diagram, you can have pictures and words and connections, and it allows you to kind of see um, how things are related. And this is particularly important for students because it allows you to see how they think things are related. Um, so you can use the key areas uh, within your uh, within a particular topic or you can do the entire course. Um, some people use them for brainstorming and planning. Some people do this naturally as part of what their learning process and or sometimes it's been more um, formalized as part of an assignment. Um, and I know a couple of you actually do mind mapping assignments. Um, and I won't call on you, but I know that you've done it and I've, I've actually been really impressed with the outcomes from classes. So I'm quoting uh, Jocelyn Mertel here because she taught a very large uh, first year rec and leisure course uh, a few times. And it used to be this um, high stakes exam that they would write. And she said, I can't do this. It's not working in an online environment. What can we do? So she built uh, a mind map assignment um, and she, I, I gave her a small contract to write it up so that everybody can reuse it. So we actually now have it, um, all of this material for you to reuse and modify if you want, because I think she did a great job and it was, you know, 200 students uh, using this as their final assignment. Um, so there's different ways, as I said, that you can use mind maps. They don't necessarily need to be a final assignment. That's why it could also be sort of done iteratively throughout the course. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that as far as note taking. Um, and it could also be used um, sort of in preparation for something else like the research paper. Here's an example from Jocelyn's class uh, that one of the students came up with, which kind of blew my mind. It's pretty complex. Um, she, you'll see in the assignment that this isn't the only thing that they submit. They actually have to write a reflection to explain uh, the, the design. But her feedback from students was that it helped them um, kind of think about the whole course um, in its entirety. Um, here's a sample rubric that she's provided. I think this is really complex for me, but um, some students really do like very detailed things. And when you try new things, it is quite helpful to um, 
think of all the different components. So if you think about um, knowledge translation, which a mind map is a form of knowledge translation. So these are the key areas like are you covering the topic in depth? Um, are you using the key pieces of, inf of communication using image and text appropriately? Um, is color used in a way that it's readable and um, accessible? Um, is it, you know, how is it presented? And are you actually um, citing your academic references? Because of course, it's not just um, for play, you're really going to be connecting. Um, the, the assignment details, I've put, there's a link back in the PowerPoint that is just in our SharePoint site. So I will put it more publicly up on our website. I'm also doing web design and uh, all these workshops. So please bear with me as I'm trying to get all these materials up. But we'll definitely get that up uh, for you tomorrow or just email me and I'll email you the Word document. Word and websites are a little bit tricky the way that you have to put them on, on the web. But right now, um, if I go back, there's a link that mind map assignment will actually take you to the Word document, but you have to be logged into the Brock SharePoint. And I'm sorry about that. That's just the nature of SharePoint. Um, some examples of tools. So eCampus Ontario has a cool toolkit that tells you like these are some digital ways, but um, so you, these are some semi-free tools. They're kind of freemium. Um, so that's one way I always recommend giving lots of choice. Um, some people like to draw right on their tablet or stylus. But paper works too, just taking a picture. As you can see, a lot of those are just pictures of, uh, um, of, of things that they've, they've jotted down. Um, so here's another example from a classics course. And this was done as part of a weekly assignment um, where the classics course was a large, it was 500 students in this large class that was broken up into seminars. And each week they were encouraged to try a different mind ma mapping technique that connected um, the lecture to seminar so that they would prepare this after watching uh, going to lecture that they prepared some kind of note te taking technique um, and then they would bring that to seminar and have a discussion and they would submit this it sort of worked um, two two ways as attendance but also as a way of demonstrating that they understood um, something so this could be built into when you're uh, if you're creating lecture videos or if you have notes for each week or even just the readings um, you know how can you take that information and show it in a different way or how it does it make make sense to you um, so I'm gonna this is shifting to note taking because these are really connected um, so we know that taking notes really does help learning. So this is back to that idea of um, assessment as learning. Um, and sometimes we don't assess note taking. It's just something that's expected, but it, it could be something that we uh, use to help students keep, uh, stay on track. Um, they found that when students take notes, the more notes they take, the better. Um, and this kind of gets into some gray area between you know typing versus handwriting. There is research that shows that handwriting um, is slightly deeper um, and they perform better, but I would I would caution you to not insist on handwriting versus typing because it's very ableist. Um, some people really do need to use their laptops. The key point about taking notes is the stopping, the thinking and translating into something that makes sense to you. And that's where using different modes of like using a mind map can be really helpful because you have to stop and think, oh, what kind of image would I use for this? Or what does this, how does this connect to something else? Um, and so what really could be an affordance when we're doing our, if we're doing our lectures as videos, so we could actually say, okay, pause, stop the video, um, you know, and 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 take a note or do a drawing that, that makes sense here. Um, and so the, the, the theories uh, behind note taking say that you should really explicitly teach these strategies. Um, and so I have some resources that you can um, share with students and the um, A to Z Learning Services has a lot of note taking um, strategies too. So you can kind of point them there and say, this is what I'm expecting you to do. And then as they do it, they can um, go along. But I do want you to, I do want you to encourage choice and I'm encouraging you to encourage choice so that if you really do prefer typing or if you prefer drawing or whatever your modality is that you are doing that, but at least you're doing something and there's some kind of artifact at the end of um, your note taking, whatever the theme is. So adding images is connected to the concept of dual coding, which we know can really in deepen learning and um, um, cause better enduring learning. Um, and so this idea too, you can also use note taking collaboratively. So using, um, 
word online or OneNote, possibly. Um, some students are quite familiar with this um, and they could um, use these tools together. Sometimes they spin up a Word uh, Google Doc which was not even an institutional tool, but we do see that happen. Um, so, but the opportunity to, to collaborate, but then pause um, and, and connect it is really good. Um, and so sometimes also, and I'll show you some example of, of this, is the scaffolded notes or the guided note taking. So for that classics course, the one week, they had some really clear prompts. Um, and it's really interesting to see this one prompt and the different types of responses that came from um, asking this sort of thing to keep it on track. So that one was more linear. This person obviously was a, a you know, loved drawing and so it made them look really interesting, but it was the point about, you know, is the content there? Um, here's an example of, um, this is on this Cult of Pedagogy website, where an instructor prepares the notes beforehand and actually sort of uh, semi-fills them in. And then after, um, and then encourages the students to, to fill them in even more. So this is um, this is sometimes done just with your PowerPoints and they're called um, uh, partial partial notes. And so you, you you're giving students the opportunity, like if you're going to actually give them the PowerPoint slides, you don't give all of the information, but you you guide them on what kinds of things you would like them to fill in. So these are what the red is what um, the student would have filled in um, from what the instructor had given. This can this looks to me like a lot of work. So I'm just I'm just giving it to you as a prompt and an idea and maybe something that you could build towards. But I just want to give you a lot of different disciplines so that you can see what it looks like um, across the board. Another really great method of note taking that you could incorporate is called Cornell Notes. Um, so that basically is just asking the students to divide the page into two, um, like one third and two thirds, and they take their notes just on the two thirds part, and then you ask them to revise and go back. So at the end of it, after they've taken their notes all the way through, you say, okay, now go back. What were the key ideas? What were some vocabulary words that you didn't know? Um, if you were to draw a picture to summarize that, what would you do? And I'll just say this, that um, I recommend this kind of strategy also in class, which is a great kind of think pair share. So I'm gonna take the opportunity that when, when we do get back into the classroom, it is a lovely thing to, to pause your lecture and say, okay, what did, you know, share it. When we do this digitally, this can be done uh, actually much, much easier and you could do it much wider perhaps in the forums or other uh, shared spaces. Um, but that opportunity to kind of um, stop and think about your notes because we know that revisiting the notes is really important. Um, just reading, rereading them is not as good as rereading them and making sense of them. Um, so this is a link to Allison Innes has made um, a great video of how to do um, Cornell notes. Um, and so you could actually, and it's designed for the first year humanities course, but you could reuse this video for any subject. She's just talking about like, how you would design your page to do this. Um, and so they've built that into that course, but it's 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 available for you to use as well. Um, so Kelly asked a great question about uh, downloading the content and lessons. Um, so what you would have to do is probably create a PDF that was down, downloadable or a Word document that was downloadable. You can use, you can, set up lessons to print as PDF and then download, but it's not as it's not as nice as I would like. <laughs> Lisa is agreeing with me. So I would uh, create some structured notes specifically that you that you share for that purpose. Um, this can also be done in a Google Doc, uh, so it doesn't or like a Word document. It doesn't need to be a handwritten thing. Again, it could be done online in some way, and it's just a uh, um, the key points are that you're looking at what that essential question is for a Cornell note, which is great because it allows them to focus on what was I studying. I'm going to cough, so I'm going to mute for a minute. Okay. All right. Um, so now I'm going to shift a little bit into talking about the research paper and essay. Um, so then there's a, you could use the article critique as a note taking method. So if you were going to, if you had, um, your research paper as your final assignment um, and they had to use some core um, articles you could use like something like an article critique to do some illustrations and I really love this is one that was provided to me when I was taking a course 
And I really did love these questions. Um, and then I used that as a framework to do some doodles and drawings about every article that I read, especially things like which quote resonated most and what pushed your buttons and what do you degree, agree and disagree. I found that really helpful in framing when I moved, when I was ready to write my paper, whether it was going to be a really useful um, article or not um, when I when I actually it came time to write that paper. So just to clarify, note taking can be done as learning. It can be done for learning. And then if you're using it as part of um, a building towards a final assignment, it can also be used of learning and it can work in conjunction with mind maps as well. It can, mind maps can be one of the note taking methods. Um, so the final paper is typically, you know, this summative. It ha happens usually at the end of term. You kind of it's due in week 10 or 11. Often, sometimes there's one in the middle as well, but there's ways that we could build the final paper that could be um, designed for academic integrity. Um, so if you build them to be scaffolded and iterative, so you could um, have uh, drafts built in. Last week we talked about doing peer review that could be built in. And if you build in opportunities to revise and edit. And so you would actually take some of the assessment away from other parts of the course and you could build it in this way. If you build in the peer review um, and editing, then you allow like a wider uh, span of topics because I know a lot of people are hesitant to put so much into one paper because there's so many topics across the, the, you know, the content that you have to cover. So building in that peer review can possibly allow, you know, a wider span. And that doesn't have to be like they're reading everybody's 12 page papers. Possibly that's done in a, in a more collaborative or a shorter way, whether it's, the, you know, the article critique and you read each other's article critiques or um, something like an annotated bibliography. And, you know, I felt kind of weird putting this together because I know that so many of you are actually actually experts in, in research papers and essays, and you probably could give me really great advice on how you design them. Um, so I, I, I found it interesting that a lot of you wanted to hear about it. Um, and again, I, this is really context uh, specific and depends on your discipline, and we're happy to talk through about how that could look. But the annotated bibliography is a very popular uh, form of of preparing students so that when they're ready to actually write their paper, that you can already make sure that the articles are, you know, sufficient, they're they're well um, sourced, you know, they're they've already gotten the um, um, they're verified, you know, that they're, you know, from a peer reviewed journal, all of those things are are checked beforehand, but it also gives you an opportunity to see for them to ensure that they're on the right track. And it could be done in conjunction with um, um, submitting whatever their research question is or their thesis or their argument. And so that could be done quite early in the term and then be done as an iterative thing. And it could be done in a way that is like a mind map as well. So do, these things don't have to be just one one thing. Um, yeah, so that article critique could be a way of doing that. Um, I will remind you that um, I was talking to A to Z Learning Services and they seem to think that this is a very beneficial thing. Um, I was like, does a checkbox make you feel more, you know, honor pledged? But they they said that students seem to respond to this. So in the assignment tool in Sakai, there is a little checkbox um, that that a student has to say, I understand that studying what in, studying with integrity means. And so they would fill out this integrity pledge and, and click it before they submit. There are different ways of ensuring they understand what integrity means uh, before and so setting out really clear expectations about collaboration so I keep saying and they can collaborate and they could do all these things but if that is not something that you want them to do then really be clear about that um, we know that collaboration and social learning does improve learning so I where possible I would like you to build it in and think about uh, creative ways of designing it that way but first if, if that's not part of your um, learning outcomes and please be explicit and, and include that in there. Um, if you do decide to use Turnitin, which is a phrase matching software, um, you just need to put this little thing in your course outline, letting students know that you're going to be using it. Um, and the lot, a lot of the stuff that I've just described now, talking about alternative submissions, are what we would suggest if somebody did have an ethical objection to using Turnitin. It's sort of, okay, then you have to show me all your notes, um, or you have to do this, or, you know, like those kinds of revisions, or, you know, you have to do an annotated bibliography. Um, so you could design the assignment from the outset um, 
that way um, and then not use Turnitin. But I, I am pragmatic. I, I said this last week as well. I understand that when you have a gigantic class that this does facilitate a lot of it. I just will leave you with a little bit of a counterpoint. <laughs> um, uh, you know, we are an academic institution. We like to work with ideas. So um, 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 Sean Morris and Jesse Stommel talk about um, the case against Turnitin. So I encourage you to read that and see how where, where you feel about it. But I do want to just kind of point it out. Um, CPI officially um, is responsible for uh, supporting Turnitin. So obviously we will support you in it, but I do want you to, to be aware of like the ethical dimensions of actually any kind of extra ed educational technology that you incorporate into your class for assessment, um, uh, you know, thinking about what, what the implications are of, of doing that. Um, so this is something, this is a drawing I did back in uh, 2011, and it's the four main points to think about for academic integrity. So key to doing the education, you know, recognizing, and so they mentioned the phrase matching, but really the key thing is the modeling and the design. So when you, uh, if you want people, you want your students to um, also adhere to academic integrity, so try and cite your sources when you have an image, you know, what, uh, if you're getting an idea, you know, like let's model that in our lectures and in our um, PowerPoint slides. Um, but also the key thing is really at the front front of the design. So we've talked about a lot of these things about how it's upfront. Um, we really want to clarify expectations from the beginning. And we do want to build this sort of pride of, of quality of work um, right into the, to the assignment. Um, so this is a short one today because that I just worked my way through all the way. So I'm going to... Uh, stop the recording and leave it here where I wanted to get some sense. I'm going to open it up for questions and discussion, um, but I'm going to stop the recording right now. And um, there's a 